Jean Folks, Chairman of JIPO, Ms. Carol Simpson, President of JIPO, Honorable guests, all our diplomats here this morning, Call. It was not that long ago that we were sitting in this room and talking about having this conference. And I'm so happy to see that it has actually happened. It's good when you talk and then something actually happens. So it's good that we're all here today. I just want to say how important it is that this conference is taking place. And indeed, it is a great pleasure to be here with all of you at this regional conference on intellectual property and the creative industries. To the teams of the Jamaica Intellectual Property Office, also known as JIPO, World Intellectual Property Office, known as WIPO, and all who played a role in organizing this conference, I commend you for your roles in promoting intellectual property rights and in supporting our creative economy. In the Caribbean, we see the creative industries as a significant engine of growth and development. Consequently, this conference was organized with a high priority focus as the first such for the Caribbean. So give yourselves a hand. We're here at a first. Through the creative industries, we possess the ability to create quality jobs and competitive products and services. For us, these industries provide a significant avenue for economic diversification and export growth. Indeed, the potential of the creative industries can be seen in the UNDP UNESCO 2013 Creative Industries Report. As stated in that report, data from 40 national studies conducted up to September 2013 suggest that the creative sector is sizable and larger than expected in most countries. The report indicates that copyright industries make a significant overall economic contribution to GDP, which varies across countries. Three quarters of the countries surveyed have a contribution between 4 and 6.5%, with the average standing at 5.2%, which is very significant. In terms of employment, the contribution of the copyright industry stands at an average of 5.36%. Three quarters of the countries fall in the range between 4 and 7% contribution to national employment. Countries with an above average share of creative industries in GDP also exhibit an above average share of employment. As stated in the report, the results of the national surveys confirm the importance of copyright-based industries for overall economic performance. Creative industries are well connected with the rest of the economy and have an active presence in the economic cycle. In many countries, creative industries are playing a more important role than some traditional industries. And I want to say welcome to Ms. Marcia Griffith, who has just entered 
the room. Please make her welcome. One of our great musical icons. Welcome, Ms. Griffith. Creative industries performance is enhanced when stimulated by governments, the legal system, and the business environment. No doubt about it, we have tremendous potential in our creative industries. Many of our artists and events have a global reach that extends well beyond the Caribbean region. I understand in Paris, they have a large reggae festival every summer. Yet with all of this, we still see newspaper headlines like this one, World Bank says Caribbean entrepreneurs lack innovation in creating quality jobs. A significant feature of the creative industries is their high labor intensity. Further development of the sector can contribute significantly towards the alleviation of our employment situation and the harvesting of creative talents of our people on a much wider scale. I can say that for Jamaica, every school that I go into, the children are just jam-packed with talent. And we must make sure that they have the opportunity to produce and grow and develop in our intellectual property space. Clearly, we do have the potential, but what is preventing us from taking the development of our creative industries to the next level? Over the years, a number of reasons have been advanced. These include lack of affordable financing, institutional and commercial bias against indigenous content in the home market, uncompetitive packaging and branding, weak marketing and distribution, piracy and copyright infringements. At the policy level, we acknowledge the importance of the creative economy to economic growth and prosperity. We recognize, however, that more needs to be done if our creative economy is to thrive. Perhaps the recommendations of the UNDP Creative Economy Report 2013 can provide a guide in forging new pathways for development among these are we need to recognize that in addition to its economic benefits, the creative economy also generates non-monetary value that contributes to achieving people-centered, inclusive, and sustainable development. Make culture a driver and enabler of economic, social, and environmental processes. Reveal opportunities through mapping local assets of the creative economy. Investigate the connections between the informal and formal sectors as crucial for informed creative economy policy development. Analyze the critical success factors that contribute to forging new pathways for local creative economy development. Invest in local capacity building to empower creators and cultural entrepreneurs, government officials, and private sector companies. Mainstream culture into local economic and social development programs, even when faced with competing priorities. And I think the Ministry of Culture, Youth and Culture would agree with me on that. Invest in sustainable creative enterprise development across the value chain. This means initiatives that nurture new talents and support new forms of creativity. It means, among other things, ladies and gentlemen, providing opportunities for cultural entrepreneurs in fields such as business management, ICT for local networking, in order to train or attract a skilled labor force. Bearing all of this in mind, JIPO, in collaboration with WIPO, Worldwide Academy, is working towards offering a first-of-its-kind master's degree program in IP along with summer courses right here at the University of the West Indies. Again, a first of its kind. Ladies and gentlemen, today, the intellectual property system is more important than ever in providing the basis to foster new products and cultivate the innovation that is so crucial in creating the next generation of jobs, investments, and growth. 
It is in this context that we welcome this conference as we continue the efforts to build and support our creative economy in the Caribbean. We are a very creative people. And I want to thank you. God has blessed us with creativity, and we're going to maximize its potential. Thank you all for attending, and I wish you a very successful conference. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to offer apologies on behalf of our minister, the Minister of Youth and Culture, the Honorable Lisa Hanna, who was unable to attend this morning. But as you heard from the Minister of State, the Minister of Youth and Culture is a key partner in how we move forward with IP development and IP structure here in Jamaica. Um, as we expand our engagement with the cultural and creative industries, it is essential that we focus on our human resource and setting up the necessary framework to not only guide their development, but to protect and safeguard their work. The world continues to be fascinated with our region. Our creativity has served to empower, to inspire, to uplift, and to add voice to the global dialogue for those who struggle to express their own concerns and their issues. The talent is overwhelming, and we can see it evident in programs such as the Top Chef, Caribbean People, figuring out in the Four St. Lucia, I know you're here, Project Runway, and of course, our own Tess and Chin being so absolutely amazing in the voice. But the world is no longer content to just absorb what we do. You heard the minister referring to France and reggae festivals, and Japan is now saying they have the biggest one-night reggae festival in the world. The world now wants to understand how we do what we do and why we do it. And so the importance of protecting our intellectual property is even more relevant today than in recent history. And our creative people will tell you that we've learned many lessons from history. There's so much talent in every single country in this region that collectively we are an absolute force to reckon with. And so we look forward to the next three days to see how we will unearth new ideas, new concepts, new approaches, and how we can begin to boost and ensure that IP is not only developed but protected here in the region. It's now my pleasure to welcome the uh, Deputy Director and Head of the Creative Industry Section of the Copyright Infrastructure Division of the World Intellectual Property Organization, Mr. Dimitar Ganchev, to bring us greetings. Put your hands together for him. very much, uh, Honorable Minister, Your Excellencies, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it is really a great pleasure to be here. Uh, it is a great occasion to be here, something which we have talked so much about, finally it took shape and it's happening, the, this regional conference on intellectual property and the creative industries in the Caribbean. From uh, the perspective of the World Intellectual Property Organization, this is our fourth such conference in the last seven years. The first conferences were in other regions, uh, in, uh, in Asia, in Latin America. Now we've come to the Caribbean. Uh, and um, you would say, why, why have we come here? Why have we chosen Jamaica? I think that uh, the reasons are, are quite obvious. Uh, it's very nice to be in the world uh, uh, capital of reggae, as you mentioned. Uh, it's very nice to be uh, among such a cultural and uh, creatively rich nation. Uh, it's nice to work with colleagues which are so committed to promoting intellectual property from JIPO. Uh, and uh, our record of cooperation uh, is indeed uh, very good with Jamaica. So let's take this opportunity and, uh, as Bob Marley used to say, to lively up ourselves. Uh, the creative industries uh, is indeed a topic which is of interest to many regions, many governments. We're witnessing an incredible interest uh, to the creative industries. 
and they are increasingly seen uh, as an enabler and as a driver in the knowledge economy. Because people seem to understand uh, more and more that there is a limit how much you can cost labor cost, how much you can compete in, in, in cutting on labor cost. So uh, everybody is trying to compete in the area of knowledge. And uh, that's where high value is created. And that knowledge needs to be protected. One of the protection mechanisms for this knowledge is using the intellectual property concept. So we hear and we see a lot of attention to creative industries as a source of growth, as a source of development. And this has been recognized not only on national, but also on regional and global level. Just last month, the United Nations General Assembly passed for the third time a resolution on the role of culture and creativity, which seems to confirm that vision that culture and creativity is a driver uh, and uh, will help the United Nations to achieve the post-2015 sustainable development goals. Uh, it is indeed um, uh, important that this will be a new addition to the pillars of growth as understood by the international community. Intellectual property um, is one of the important enabling factors for the creative industries. Let's not forget that uh, without uh, your own creativity, there wouldn't be creative industries, so that they're built on creativity. But there are tools like intellectual property which can help the industries grow and develop. Um, and uh, we should always keep in mind while talking about the creative industries that at the heart of the creative industries is the creator. That's the creator to whom we are uh, turning in today's deliberations. Uh, the interest towards intellectual property in recent years is also increasing. And uh, even in times of economic difficulties that many countries have witnessed, uh, the use of the intellectual property system has actually grown. Our own uh, registration systems in, in, in WIPO suggest that the growth in registration of different forms of intellectual property has actually grown at such a pace which is much, much faster than the growth rates for the overall economy, which means that people continue to turn to intellectual property as one of the tools to protect their businesses and to grow them. Uh, at the same time, the international consensus around uh, intellectual property uh, is becoming difficult. And um, perhaps uh, the area of copyright is uh, one little exception where for the last two years we have seen two new international treaties see the day of light. Uh, and uh, we certainly hope that uh, more uh, and better legislation will be agreed upon on the international level to provide a level playing field for all creators. In order for the creative industries to function, you need uh, uh, the appropriate infrastructure. And that infrastructure involves the conditions in which creators can further develop and uh, produce creative content that we can all use. That infrastructure has many elements, and we are going to discuss in these three days the various parts of this infrastructure the policy, the technology, the organizational, the social elements which you need to have in place if you want really a well-performing creative society. There are many challenges today that uh, creative industries are facing, uh, challenges of different nature. Uh, and uh, I think that one of our great tasks today would be to see if we can emit a positive message about the potential of intellectual property to support the creative sector. Because we need uh, to spread the word and to increase the overall understanding in society of the benefits which this protection brings to creators and how it can help them to make a living and to bring in additional income streams. In the past, conferences like this have led to certainly the creation of a, of a big momentum in societies. Uh, I am confident that uh, the deliberations in these three days uh, uh, hopefully will generate more interest to the topic, but I'm even more hopeful that together with, uh, with you, with our friends and the representatives of the government, of the creative uh, structures, uh, we will be able 
uh, to design perhaps uh, some uh, action plans or some uh, uh, interesting directions for future work which will enable us to project some of our ideas in the future and put them into action. Creative industries is pretty much about collaborations. Collaborations on all levels. And I'm uh, very happy that uh, uh, the Honorable Minister quoted uh, the, uh, the UN uh, Creative Economy Report. Um, in fact, the right title should be the UN Creative Economy Report because it was uh, a joint effort with all agencies, uh, uh, with the support of, of UNESCO, with the support of uh, uh, UNCTAD with the support of WIPO. So I'm particularly happy because you quoted from the part which WIPO submitted for this <laughs> report. So I kind of recognized our submission, uh, which was uh, done with, uh, with a lot of, uh, of uh, attention and care. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a regional conference. I'm extremely thankful to the representatives of the other countries from the Caribbean for um, taking the trouble to come here. Uh, I do hope it's going to be interesting for you and that may give you some ideas, and let's talk about what do we do with them in the future. Without much ado, having such an interesting lineup of speakers, um, we try to provide you, for you only the best, you know. Uh, so uh, let's not uh, waste any more time, uh, and uh, I would like to thank you very much for your attention, and I hope you stay until the end of the conference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Gantrev. And you heard him talk about just how much we're going to be focusing on infrastructure over the next three days. And certainly today, in a short while, we'll hear from our keynote speaker on creativity, the new currency of the knowledge economy. And then later today, the creative industries as a factor for economic growth and the Exim Bank monetizing intellectual property. So please, we hope you'll stay with us throughout the rest of the day as we explore those topics. And now from the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, I'd like to welcome the Deputy Secretary General, His Excellency Petko Dragunov. Thank you very much. Um, Madam Minister, Hon Honorable Sharon Fox Abrams, distinguished uh, participants, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed a great pleasure for me to be here and to address this regional conference on intellectual property and the creative industries. My organization, the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, has been working in the area of creative industries for many years now. Indeed, if this year UNCTAD is to celebrate its 50th anniversary, some 20 of those years, uh, uh, we've been uh, trying to make a contribution to um, developing countries' creative industries. The venue of our conference uh, could not be more appropriate for the consideration of creative industries, uh, since much of the work that I mentioned actually started here. It was based on the realization that even though Jamaica was the birthplace of reggae, and was brimming with musical talent, the country was not gaining a substantial share of the benefits from what is a real musical success story. And this anomaly called for a broader examination of the development potential of the music industry and then later on of the wider set of what we now call the creative industries. Those are the industries that create products and services based on an intensive application of the intangible assets, such as creativity, information and knowledge, generally defined as culture. And one of the reasons why the creative industries are of great interest to development economists and practitioners around the world is that this is one of a few areas where developing countries actually are on a fully equal footing with the developed world. Developing countries may not have the same productive capacities or high value added in industrial products or the same capital for large-scale infrastructure projects, but they do have large pools of creative talent and enormous cultural heritage. Thus, here is an industry whose main input is equally distributed around the globe, and if harnessed more effectively, it could provide significant development opportunities. In addition, the sector has many positive spillovers for broader human development, 
such as poverty eradication, gender and youth empowerment, environmental sustainability. Most artisans, most artisans in the creative industries are self-employed, and many of them are women. Experiences from Africa, Latin America, Asia, and other parts of the world can attest to how creative industries are supporting the national transformation of countries. Just two examples in the film sector, namely Bollywood in India and Nollywood in Nigeria, are indicative of how creative creativity and entrepreneurial drive can attain success at the international level. Nollywood is providing more than a million jobs, particularly to the youth in the state of Lagos, and is reported to generate some 500 US dollars in annual revenue. And the development potential of the creative industries is growing. Indeed, markets for creative goods and services based on indigenous knowledge, design, and local culture have grown dramatically worldwide as more powerful channels of dissemination have emerged, and they are showing greater resilience to global economic shocks. Over the period of 2002 to 2010, international trade in creative goods and services grew at an average annual rate of more than 10% and totaled 624 United States dollars in 2011, up from 261 billion in 2002. Such exports include arts and crafts, books, graphic and interior design works, fashion, films, music, new media, printed media, visuals and audiovisuals. While the developed countries continue to dominate these markets, particularly in high value products, the South is catching up with exports of creative goods to the world reaching 184 billion in 2010. Of course, creative artists and artisans in developing countries have numerous obstacles. Creative industries are classically driven by the production and distribution of rents. However, the effective collection of such rents often requires both legal frameworks and effective enforcement. Also, developing countries' artists often lack access to the marketing tools needed to reach wider audiences. And even when such access is achieved, often enough, a large share of the rent remains with the big marketing and its distribution companies. Today, some six major record companies own more than 85% of the copyrights. And the growing use of digital dissemination will bring new challenges and opportunities. So what kind of policy measures can help developing countries better harness their pools of talent and creativity for development? Obviously, there is a wide range of different measures, and the priorities will depend on each country's particular situation. However, a first step would be to fully recognize the developmental potential of these industries and to set up targeted support measures. These can range from support for small and medium-sized enterprises in the creative industries, such as easy registration and possible tax breaks, as well as access to special financing mechanisms. Governments could also support the creation of cooperatives and professional associations and facilitate capacity building and skills development for creative artists and artisans. Finally, a policy to support the creative industry sector as a possible growth vehicle could also include policies to attract investment in the area and to encourage joint ventures and co-productions with established companies, including abroad. Public-private partnerships could as well be explored. A second set of possible measures relates to supporting the ability of creative industries to reap benefits from their efforts. This means increasing awareness of intellectual property frameworks and reinforcing domestic legal frameworks and related institutions, such as collecting agencies. A third set of issues relates to helping domestic creative industries access global markets. Here there is need to facilitate better access to global marketing and distribution networks. Greater use of digital media can help address this problem in part, and in this context, supporting access to new technologies will of course be important. But there is also a need to reconsider some IP frameworks and their suitability for the digital age, as well as the distribution of rents from copyrighted material. And these are only some of the possible measures. Several countries have already adopted initiatives to support creative industries as part of their industrial policies. ONGTAD has assisted a number of countries such as Mozambique, Zambia, Thailand and China 
in formulating or revising creative industry policies and related institutions and regulatory measures. And in addition, we have carried out policy-oriented research through the preparation of the creative economy reports that my colleagues mentioned. The first issue was produced in 2008 on the challenges of assessing the creative economy with contributions from UNDP, UNESCO, WIPO, and ITC. The second issue of the Creative Economy Report was produced in 2010 on the creative economy as a feasible development option. And last year, UNDP and UNESCO with WIPO produced a special edition of the creative economy with contributions from UNCTAD and other organizations to focus on local level cultural and creative industry development. This is all to say that um, I'm really looking forward to hearing, hearing from you about ways and means to foster creative industries as a development tool and seize the opportunities that they may present for the achievement of our common goal of prosperity for all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Dragunov. The conference wouldn't be possible without the support of a number of organizations, and I just want to take some time to acknowledge them. The Tourism Enhancement Fund, the National Export Import Bank of Jamaica, RJR 94 FM, Television Jamaica, the Gleaner Company Limited, the Public Broadcasting Corporation of Jamaica, and of course the Ministry of Industry, Investment, and Commerce. May I have a round of applause for all our sponsors? As we've told you, the conference continues over the next two days. On day two, we'll be looking at the legal infrastructure for creative industries, digital opportunities and developments for creative industries, and putting creative economy on the policy agenda. And then on day three, intellectual property and digital publishing, gaming and animation, and protection of Caribbean popular music. And today we'll get some insight into that when we hear from some of the creators in the industry, the wonderful Marcia Griffiths and Jesse Royal. But now it's my pleasure to introduce the manager of copyright and related rights a directorate of JIPO, Miss Marissa Longsworth, who will introduce our keynote speaker. A round of applause for her. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It is my pleasure today to introduce our keynote speaker, Mr. John Hawkins. His full biography is on the front page of your program, but there are numerous highlights of his career which I must mention. He is described by several sources as the father of the creative economy and credited in the 2013 UNESCO Special Report on Creative Economy as popularizing the term creative economy and applying it to 15 industries extending from the arts to science and technology. He reasons that although there is recognition of cultural activities and processes as the core of a powerful new economy, it is also concerned with manifestations of creativity in domains that would not usually be understood as cultural. John is a global advisor on the development of creative economies. He is a director of John Hawkins & Co. in London and Hawkins & Associates in Shanghai. He was chairman of BOP Consulting, Britain's leading advisory company on culture, creativity, and innovation from 2008 to 2011. The Shanghai government set up the John Hawkins Center for the Creative Economy in 2006. Hawkins and Associates is currently advising on new projects in Shanghai, Beijing, and Wuxi. He is the founder and director of the Adelphi Charter on Creativity, Innovation, and Intellectual Property, and devised the London Intellectual Property Advisory Service, known as Own It. He was associated with HBO and Time Warner from 1982 to 1996, with responsibilities for TV business development in the UK and Europe. He has a bachelor's in 
International Relations and a Master's in Urban Design. He is visiting, he's a visiting professor at City University London and the Shanghai School of Creativity. He is also a member of BAFTA. I would like to share a quote from a recent TEDx talk given by Mr. Hawkins, where he said, everybody is born creative. It's not a special faculty or an unusual faculty. It's the mark of an ordinary human being. In fact, if they don't have the imagination, if they don't have the ability to adapt to external data, if they don't compare the reality of what's out there with their imaginings and memories of the past, they are just not a normal, healthy child. <laughs> and ladies and gentlemen, that is in fact the essence of intellectual property, the innate ability to devise creations of our minds. Being a creator is a job which changes each day. It is dynamic. It is innovative, it is fun, and most importantly, it is very valuable. No one knows that better than Mr. John Hawkins. Please welcome him to the podium. Okay. Thank you for that absurdly long introduction. Um, but, um, but you missed out one important point. Um, um, we heard about the, the, the Japanese festival of reggae. Yes. And I was in Trenchtown on Saturday, yes. and I saw a Japanese singer singing reggae yes. in Trenchtown. Yes. I mean, how cool is that? I mean, that would not, not, that would not have happened 20 years ago. <laughs> no. right? OK. Yes. So um, I'm going to start with this band which I hope you all recognize. Um, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, I don't know. Um, I've, um, I discovered them in 1970, and I've just, in the last few months, really come back again to listen to their music, American Beauty in particular, um, and Box of Rain. Great, great music. And I'm showing you for two reasons. One is it's nice, I think, to start with an artist at these conferences. It's nice, as you said, it all starts with the individual, starts with the artist. And also, coming over on the plane from London, I was reading the Financial Times, and they quoted Jerry Garcia, who's the guy at the back with the black beard looking vacant, looking out of the frame. It's interesting, actually, that they, none of those guys knew how to pose in front of a photographer. <laughs> you know, I mean, a boy band today would know how to look. <laughs> These guys don't know how to look. Anyway, he was quoted, Jerry Garcia was quoted as saying, I don't want to be better than anybody else. I don't mean better than anybody else. I just want to do something that nobody else can do. And I think that is essentially what an artist wants to do. They're not interested when they're better than anybody else. They're just doing something that only they can do. And it's sort of, we talk about it as expressing the individual, but it's not, it's, it's bigger than that. Because it's expressing their vision of how the world should be. Um, you've heard that I take a wide approach to creativity. I'm gonna give some examples. Um, the Lord of the Rings, the three books, um, turned into a film. Uh, by Peter Jackson, he had a problem. He had to animate hundreds and thousands and hundreds of thousands of orcs who were people who were um, of small brain, uh, not very clever people, um, ugly people, not, not attractive people, um, frightened people. And they used to move around the countryside in huge numbers. And they had to develop new software for this. And they did it. They got an Oscar for the software. Peter Jackson made the three films. They put the software back on the shelf. They offered it to Warner Brothers, new line, actually, the 
subsidiary of Warner Brothers that financed the movie. They said, no, Hollywood never, never invest in technology. There's a good reason for that. Never invest in technology. So the company called Massive, based in Wellington, New Zealand, thought, what should we do with this software? And there was an extraordinary meeting between the chief operating officer, who was living in a commune in Los Angeles at the time, and she met a fire prevention officer. She used to be working with the Los Angeles Fire Prevention Brigade. Recently gone to Ove Arab, a big construction company. And he said to her, he said to Diana, this software I stand more closely, um, solves a problem that I have of modeling how people behave when they're under stress and they're frightened in a building that's on fire. And they they'd slightly tweaked the, the software. This is a version of them tweaking it. And that's Oxford Circus in London because they crowded, they crowded, and they decided that they could have people go diagonally across it. And they modeled how people would do that with the same software that was developed for Lord of the Rings. And I like this example because it shows how ideas move from entertainment, filmmaking, software, modeling, urban design. It also shows, I, I spoke to Nate Willisick about this, and at one point I said, knowing what the answer would be, I said, Nate, you're such a creative guy. And he got really upset. And I like the fact that a lot of people out there doing what I think are very creative things, actually, um, but they never use the word. What we're talking about is bigger than the word. There's a lot of stuff happening out there that is creative and innovative, but is not described by those two words. My next example is Skyfall, uh, the most successful Bond film ever. And you may remember in the film that he gets into his beloved, iconic, gray Aston Martin car, and he drives up to his parents' house in Scotland, parks it outside, goes inside to defend the house against the baddies who are about to attack. There's the car outside the house. And the baddies attack and they blow up the car. Now, everybody watching the movie, if you thought about it, you would have realized that's the model. You probably didn't think about it, but if I asked you, you'd said it's the model. What you probably didn't realize that was a model printed on a 3D printer. That car is printed on a 3D printer. Again, what is this? Is this manufacturing? Is it software? Because you've got to write the software to drive the printer. You need material science to get the right goo to build up the car. You need designers. And it's all taking part as what we call entertainment, or filmmaking, or design or manufacturing. My next example, my last example, is this picture. Two Chinese guys hanging out in Hong Kong last August, what looks like a Van Gogh painting. In fact, it wasn't a Van Gogh painting. It was a, it was a copy of a Van Gogh painting. It was on sale for um, 32,000 US dollars. A lot of money. But it was a very, very, very good copy. And the, the guy that was trying to sell it said it's virtually indistinguishable from the real thing. And what was interesting to me about this was the guy making that remark was not some shady dealer from South China Pearl River Delta, who was the director of the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam, whose job it is to protect the integrity 
and the authenticity of the work. And he's selling copies. Again, printed with a 3D printer. The frame is printed with a 3D printer. The canvas with a 3D printer. And the, 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 the oil is very realistically printed. And it, it is. It really is virtually English swinging for the real thing. And that was in 2013. In 20 years' time, it will be virtually, it will be indistinguishable. Without X-ray analysis, it will be indistinguishable. There's a possibility the art market will just collapse. So what are we talking about? I tend to talk about, I tend to separate what we're talking about into three things. One is creativity, this human, instinctive, uh, intellectual process with a lot of emotion attached to it and sometimes a lot of spirituality attached to it. It has no commercial value. It's a human aptitude. A human, it's a process that we, we go through. It's very private. Very, very private. Then there's the creative ecology which is the social circumstances within which we live, breathe, work, play, and then there's the business, the creative economy. And I always try to keep those three things separate. And when we talk about creativity, we're not talking about business. And when we're talking about business, we're not talking about the emotions and the intellectual processes that we're going through. Um, I did some work in Shanghai for the Chinese government in, um, about seven, eight years ago. They asked me to look at the school curriculum for teenagers to see if it was suitable for kids growing up in a global creative economy. And I wrote a very long and rather boring report um, for that. And at the end of that, I was asked to sum it up very succinctly. And I came up with these three principles. The first you've heard about, everybody's born creative. And it is actually the mark of a normal human being. And we are at our most creative from the moment the baby is born. I, I, I sort of think that we peak at around eight, ages three and four. <laughs> Everybody here has peaked. Sorry, but that's it. And there's the very reason for that. You're, you're, you're more free when you're young, and, but also, crucially, when you're four, you go to school. And there you learn rules, and you learn how to socialize, and how to behave, and, and how to obey orders from the teacher. So th that's bad news for most people's creativity. <laughs> Again, I'm talking about the inner, inner aptitude. Um, but we, we want to share, we want to talk, we want to, we want to, we want to gossip, we want to... And sometimes we need other people to develop our ideas. So, we need freedom, that creativity needs freedom. And this is sort of linked to those old ideas about free speech and uh, freedom of expression, but again, wider than that. It's really the ability to manage your relationship to an idea. To say yes to an idea and no to an idea. Again, for reasons of purely personal interest. What ideas do you find interesting? What idea is catch your imagination? And then we need freedom to operate in markets. We need markets. Markets are fundamentally important. We need access to markets. The markets have to be open. They have to be transparent. They have to be efficient. So the buyers can find sellers, and sellers can find buyers. And they have to be fair. And one of the big roles of government is in its country to make sure that its markets for creative goods and services are fair. Whether it's a producer trying to sell a program to the broadcasting station, or any, any market, we need them to be fair. Um, at some point, I always like to talk about success. Um, 
but I'm going to do so in rather an odd way, and I hope you forgive me. Because um, what I'm really doing here is saying that creativity is, is difficult. Personally, I can't prove this, but I think it's more difficult than traditional agriculture or traditional repetitive manufacturing. I think it's, it's, it's more difficult. And unless we realize that, we're going to make mistakes. It is, I think many people know that secret in their hearts that it's difficult. But sometimes we don't want to talk about it. And I think it's difficult in two ways. I, I have what I call the two judges. There's the first judge inside my brain who annoyingly keeps on saying, John, is this the best you can do? Can't you be a little bit more imaginative? Can't you work harder? Can't you, come on, do better than that. And it's a private dialogue, and it's usually very irritating. This is not a nice judge. And it's, it's a cause of depression, and uh, lo it's, lonely, it's very lonely, all this stuff. So it's a cause of, of depression, and some people just lose confidence. And then, even after I satisfy that judge, there's another judge that's saying, OK, well, that's the best you can do, but is the market interested? Are people out there interested in what you've done? And I find that everybody has these two judges, and some pay more attention to the first and some to the second. So, some people are more interested in, in what they can do, regardless of whether the market is interested or not. And some of those are the greatest artists. Van Gogh, who is one of my, I mean, I admire that man so much, not only for what he did as a painter, but what he, how he wrote about it. It is the best literary record of the artist's journey that I've ever come across. Nobody bought his book. I think he sold about five or six works for like very, very small sums of money. But he was undeniably one of the greatest artists. So we all face these two judges. And I, I think the reality is that we are found wanting more often than we succeed. I think in a repetitive economy, we, we set up a process, we check it, it looks all right, we press the button, it goes ahead, we monitor it, we check for errors, we correct the errors, it keeps on going. Creativity is looking for something that is interesting, interesting, interesting to us and to others. And that's harder, and we fail more often. And the creative economy I, I put up there is, a, is an economy of failure. And, and, and we have to recognize this when we are talking about it to children and to teenagers and to their parents. This is, this is difficult. This is difficult. We have, to, we have to think about how we encourage and support people to be creative. Otherwise, they will try, it won't work, they'll get disheartened, they won't try again. It's very competitive, and we fail a lot. I'm going to talk now about some trends. Um, there's a shift in what people want as societies develop, as our needs for, as our physical needs are, are met uh, for, for, for shelter and food and water, we start to want, we start to feel our emotional needs. Security changes from just having a physical shelter to emotional love. And then we want to explore our minds and our imaginations. And Abraham Maslow, the American psychologist who came up with this idea of a hierarchy of needs, said at the top there was what he called self-fulfillment, which at the end of his life he broke down into two, which he said was the search for beauty and the search for knowledge, for understanding, often to control, just to understand. And the creative economy is very often providing goods and services and experiences where people can meet their needs for beauty, 
elegance, enjoyment, style, or knowledge, to know more about the world. Sometimes those things come together and sometimes they, they conflict. We're moving from a time when artists were single people um, expressing inspiration to where they collaborate. And as new forms of creativity are developed, the opportunities for collaboration become more important. There's a shift from hierarchies, from big companies with rules and regulations, having lots of employees, most of whom work there for a very long time, into swarms, clusters. I like the idea of swarms because they're like bees coming together, going apart. And many people are a member of more than one swarm. And I put down there just in time. That's a, we all know about just in time logistics. We're moving to a world now where we have just in time people. If I want something done in London, I'm very, very unlikely to employ somebody. Employment is diminishing as a, as, a, as, a, as a way of working. I will hire someone to do a specific job, and I will pay them for that job. And it's much more of a mutual relationship, and I will hope to learn from them as well as them doing something for me. Much more mutual. We're shifting from atoms to bits. Um, the internet is, is profoundly influencing, it's becoming clear, not only media, but the way everything is produced, distributed, promoted, priced, sold, used, reused, copied, reused, repurposed, dramatically changing everything here. It's the biggest economy in the world. It's the fastest growing economy in the world. And I put up some figures there for the number of Chinese, what they call netizens, citizens, netizens, they call them netizens. Um, the world is breaking down into the Chinese cyberspace and the American cyberspace. Uh, the Chinese cyberspace is, is really big um, in terms of the numbers of people that subscribe to the internet and in terms of the number of companies. There's a company called Alibaba, which does more business every day than Amazon and eBay put together. These are seriously big companies, and they're growing at about 20, 30% a year. So we know the country is large, with 1.3 billion people. But the size of the internet community in China is, well, you can see the figures, and it's growing really fast. Um, my book is published by Penguin, and Joe Lusby, who's worked for Penguin in China for now about seven or eight years, she made this remark some years ago, and I, I, I check out with her about once a year, and I say, Joe, are you still, you know, can I still quote you on this? And she says, yeah, I, I think it's still true. She's saying that every significant development in publishing in China had its origins on the internet. So the internet is not something that is a, a little add-on. It's the main business. We, we in Europe sort of made that shift probably about two or three years ago. It's, it's, it, it, it's driving the kind of person who writes. Where do authors come from? That's how it's changing that. It's changing what they write, the formats that they like, the length of what they, of what they write. It's changing distribution, obviously. It's changing pricing. It's changing every part about the publishing process. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about some media impacts here. Um, 
just very briefly. Um, you're probably familiar with the, with the collapse of the recorded music market. Um, CDs are beginning to be quaint. Um, I, travel with, I travel with, I think, what I, I travel with an iPod, a smartphone, an iPad, and a laptop computer, and none of them play CDs. And, and, and most modern computers, and, and you know, they, don't play, they don't play CDs. So you have to go home and put it in a big device. You know, that's, that's increasingly not how people are living anymore. The future, is, the future is streaming. And I think we know the albums were slow to pick up on that, but I think the musicians are also quite slow to pick up on that. We have to think about that. The long tail is very thin. Um, my main business is film and television, and I don't know anybody who increases the budget of a movie because they expect the long tail. Doesn't affect the budget at all. Some people will make more revenues, but you never know who. And the amount of money is very small. The amount of money is really small. The long tail is very thin. Press. The press is... We often forget about this. It's, 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 it's hit harder than music. The, the advertising revenues are going right down and sales are going right down, particularly amongst young people. I say it's destroying periodicity. By that I mean that um, in, in 10, 15 years' time, I don't know, time scales are very difficult, but um, the difference between a magazine and a newspaper will no longer exist. Because the only difference is, 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 is the periodicity, when they're published, a week, a day, a month, and the format. They look different. But if everything goes online and is updated every day, and they all look the same on the screen, then the difference between a newspaper and a magazine is, is, is trivial. So I'm going to get back to this. I didn't really deal with this, but... Um, <laughs> These are figures from SoundScan, which is the US data collection agency for music. And I don't have more recent data, but in 2012, 8 million unique tracks were sold, which sounds a lot, of which almost a third sold only one unit, which was probably the performer's mother, or girlfriend, or boyfriend. A third sold one unit. 94% sold fewer than 100. And then 100, 0.00001% sold over a million. One of the results of the internet is that the music business and the publishing business and the book business is becoming much more competitive. You can't hear, sorry. <laughs> Film. Sorry, no, I'll, I'll, I, I was standing back so you could see. It's okay. It's fine. It's fine. Um, I, I, I'm going to mention two things here. Again, this is my own business. And what's happening is that the film business is becoming really expensive. Um, the budgets are going up because of the costs of marketing and advertising. Margins are shrinking. And most of the Hollywood studios are losing money. Meanwhile, television is, of all the, of all the creative industries, the one growing the fastest and becoming very profitable. Because they can play around with distribution 
and they can play around with the pricing. Film can't do that. Television can play around with distribution and play around with pricing. It's also the case that um, TV writers and directors are now taking more risks than film producers and filmmakers. And, the, and their work is cheaper. Two very compelling reasons why now, in Europe and America, most of the interesting, what we call film entertainment, is consisting of television series. It's costing about four million an episode, significantly cheaper per, per hour than a Hollywood movie, or even a big British movie. And so the, the shift of creative endeavor and financial profitability is moving away from the big studios into television. So these are the, these are the top line headings for entertainment. And I come back to this thing again about new entrants who are often outside of regulation exploiting new ideas about distribution and pricing. Distribution and pricing. Now, um, there's another reason why the new entrants are being so successful. Uh, we did some work in the UK about two years ago. Uh, I chaired a group of, of um, TV, film, and uh, software companies. And we, we were wondering what we should be doing about the internet. And we realized that we had, all of us, had a, um, what we call a clunky business model. We were not giving people what they wanted. It was so frustrating. You, you heard about a book that had been published and you wanted to buy it, but it was not available in your country. Or you, you, you saw a review of a film that went into the cinemas for two weeks and you wanted to see it, but it was no longer in the cinemas and the, D the DVD was not available and you couldn't stream it down to your computer. You couldn't download it. However much money you wanted to pay, you're willing to pay, so what do you do? Well, many people steal. I mean, uh, we, we've all stolen, come on. We've all stolen. I was once taught, well, no, no. So <laughs> we, we, we realized that there were four demands that consumers have that they want to buy creative goods and services with the same facility and the same convenience as they buy everything else. It's so simple. And, and we weren't giving it to them. We, we just weren't giving it. I could buy a chair, I could buy an apple, I could buy a bit of paper um, with great facility and I could take it with me around the world. We could not do that with film and television or music. And we were, be, we were being very slow as an industry. And I'm talking, the, on the working party, there was Warner Brothers and there was Sony, there was the BBC, the big players. We all realized we were being very slow to meet consumer demands for convenience. And we came up with these, these four demands, that people want to watch, they want the freedom to choose what to do, when to do it, where to do it, and how to pay for it. And we were some way away from meeting those demands. And we, we are now getting better at it. It's difficult. In, in, in the film business, we have battles between the, 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 the distributors and the cinemas. The cinemas want to have their window. They don't want to be distributing uh, DVDs or streaming or downloading at the time the film is in the cinema. So really tough negotiations have to go on, but we have to do that. Otherwise, we will be losing revenue and theft will increase. Innovation. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about this, but I just want to say that uh, I did an analysis recently of 
R&D spend in big companies like Microsoft and Samsung and Apple and big traditional manufacturing companies, car companies. And you can see a decline in what I call their formal R&D budgets. And an increase in the numbers of people who were not part of the R&D effort in the company, but were nonetheless doing research. If you think about it, every startup is an R&D company. That's what, that's what a startup does. It does research. And it tries to develop its ideas and take them to market. It's an R&D company. No country I know of ever classifies a startup as an R&D company. They just don't do it. The, it. the classification is at fault. If you're sitting with some friends of yours in a new company, in a startup, you're trying to develop a new app, you're doing R&D. So the R&D has moved outside of the laboratory to become normal working practice. And so the kids understand this, but the rest of us have to catch up a little bit. Um, in the UK, we had a, a report recently called Next Gen, which was the next generation. Because we realized we were really slow at teaching kids at school how to write code. They, could, they, they were taught how to handle somebody else's application typically a Microsoft application. They were not taught how to write their own applications. And we've, we're making a major shift now in the way we teach people how to write code. And I have a particular interest in this. I work a lot in China. And um, I realized about, about two years ago that someone in London probably doesn't, sp uh, uh, doesn't speak Chinese more likely for a Chinese person to speak English. But if you work in the computer software business, you're, write, you're using the same digital languages. You're, using, you're writing the same code in the same program languages. So the opportunities for collaboration between programmers is much easier than it is with old analog speech. So, to end, um, I have a phrase, it's not, actually it's not my phrase, it's a wonderful Indonesian man called Sejka Moka. Had this phrase about the learning capacity of a nation. And when Indonesia became independent, he, he argued very strongly that the people's learning capacity was more important than money or technology. He just wanted his people to be educated, but it's wider than education, so they could learn. And he had this phrase, learning capacity. I borrow that phrase, and I, he, he applied it to the nation. I apply it to any group of people. The nation, the city, a company, a university. We all have a capacity to learn. Some of us use it, some of us don't. And we need to have a society which has a high capacity to learn, and every day tries to expand this capacity to learn. I think there are four steps. The first is to know what is happening in the country. I put down the GDP or markets. Governments need to know about GDP or value added. They're related to different, the UK uses value added, but the global standard is GDP. Business people don't care about GDP or value added. Business people care about markets. And are the markets, as I said, open, accessible, free, efficient, and fair? So when a government focuses on GDP data, that's fine. But it would be great if they also looked at whether the markets in their country fulfilled the criteria. Second, the Shanghai propositions. Um, are we really treating everybody as potentially creative? Are we really doing that? Particularly in our primary schools. 
Are we giving people freedom to say no as well as to say yes? And are we enabling our markets to work well? The creative audit is, in a sense, where the hard work begins, because this means that every law, regulation, has to be checked to make sure that it is supportive of a creative economy. It may have grown up for some other reason. It may have grown up to support a monopoly. It may have grown up for agriculture or manufacturing or some other reason. It may be suitable for then. Is it suitable for now? And everything has to be checked, not only in the arts and cultures um, area, but tax, fiscal policy, competition policy is very important, obviously. Um, intellectual property, absolutely critical. Education, learning, learning is important. Foreign policy, urban design. Do people have the right to use the buildings in the way they want to use them? We, we've had to change our policy in London on urban design probably faster than we change our arts policy. Fundamentally important. And then leadership. Leadership is this strange quality. But if you look around at countries that have a successful creative economy, you, you fasten in upon the leaders. Sometimes political leaders, sometimes artists, musicians, people who have championed what they're doing. And I'm going to end up with two quotes. One from an IBM report. IBM interviewed 1,600 chief executives around the world, 60 countries. And those executives, this was in 2010, four years ago, those executives agreed that the key quality for the future was creativity. This is IBM. This isn't some arts body, you know, which would of course said that. This is IBM. And they described one of the characteristics of this as being comfortable with ambiguity. Being comfortable with ambiguity. I think for a company like IBM to say that is, is remarkable. Um, and the final quote is from Walt Disney. I regard Walt Disney as the Steve Jobs of his time. Megalomaniac, uh, a great inventor, a great designer, a great actor, Disney was, and a great filmmaker. And he completely changed the whole world of animation. He completely changed animation. He completely changed it. And what he's saying here is that the future is not something that is out there waiting for us to sort of discover it or read about it. Uh, the future is inside us, and it happens first in our mind and the imagination, and then it happens in the will by us taking action. Someone said, here we talk a lot, and now we've taken action. And I think that's what Walt Disney was saying. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Mr. John Hawkins, how enlightening was that? It really was. And I can tell you, sir, you've not just increased our learning capacity, but you've stimulated our appetite to learn much more about our creative industries. Coding may one day become a basic school subject. Yes. Not too long ago, we were in the paper age. Huh? So it's important that we acknowledge the way technology has been advancing and the various shifts in creative production and how they impact what we produce, how we produce it, and that we should not just strive for freedom to create, but we have to also acknowledge that our consumers want freedom to choose. Another round of applause for our keynote speaker. And so when we talk about IP, we're looking not just ahead, but we're also looking at how do we preserve our creative legacy. 
And our next presenter has been at the core of Jamaican music development for 50 years. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the Empress of Jamaican music, the wonderful Marcia Griffiths O.D. <laughs> Greetings, everyone. Very warm welcome to our distinguished guests, especially those from the Caribbean visiting our beautiful island. Yes, nice to have you. I feel very privileged to be here this morning sharing these moments with you. And I am truly blessed to have survived for 50 years in a male-dominated business. <laughs> and I also feel blessed that God has chosen me with a talent to communicate to the world through the medium of music. And um, I don't think every one of us who are in this position know how blessed we are and the responsibility that we take on, you know, in this creative business. Because we are here, the world depends on us and the, what we feed the children with. And the word is the most important thing. So what we are sending out to the world through the medium of music is so very important. Because we are here to teach, educate, and uplift everyone through the medium of music. So I am truly thankful that I am blessed to be a part of this occasion. I am also very thankful that God has preserved me, that I can live to see this day, 50 years in the business. And I am thankful for the journey that I have traveled with so many turbulence and potholes and all kind of things. I am thankful that I could have inspired every other female as a woman. I think that was my duty, and I think that was my portion from God, to have inspired the sisters, be a role model to them, that today I can stand here and say, this is no more male-dominated. Yes, I am thankful for that. Along the journey, I've had some very pleasant moments. And um, one of my highlights on my journey was with, of course, you know, Brother Bob. That was one of my highlights. And I am thankful for Bob, and I'm thankful that I could be a part of that experience because I can stand there today and testify that Bob Marley was truly chosen by Almighty God to do the work that he did. He was one of the most creative persons I have ever met in my life. And he's the one who really opened my eyes to the music, to realize that music was not just entertainment. It was much deeper. When I saw how serious this man took his music, it was his life. Nothing came before his music. And the places that I've traveled with Bob, Japan, Australia, Europe, all over the world, all the seas that he sowed in those places. For the first time, reggae music was touching all these places. When I returned to these places, the seeds were, the seeds that were sown was grown. You can see the result today. All over the world, Bob Marley music lives. Everything that he has uttered in his music has manifested today in this time. We can sit here and play Bob Marley music and it is relevant today in what is happening. So I have no doubt that Bob Marley was truly sent by God to do this work. And as I said, I've never known anyone as creative and unique as Bob Marley. And I'm truly thankful that 
for that part of my journey. And also, one of my highlights in my journey was Bob Andy, meeting Bob Andy, and of course we had our first big hit song in England, Young, Gifted, and Black. We were young, naive, we didn't know anything about copyright, nothing about the music. Well, of course, Bob had a little experience of the music, and I was fortunate to have met him, and he was like my guide, a father figure for me. So that part of my journey was my learning experience. We were exposed to people who used us, manipulate us, and we didn't get anything from our work that we were doing. I remember one day I was in Harry J's studio, and he had a Chris Benz parked inside there, and a guy said to Bob, Bob, is this your car? And he said, no, it's my money, buy it, but it's not mine. <laughs> and I mean, that was so true, because here we are, young people, traveling all over England, no returns. I mean, we were happy to be doing what we were doing because we were just excited, young and don't know, you know. But all of that, with the rain and the sunshine, it brought about rainbow. And I have no regrets on my journey. And uh, I, am, I usually say if I had the opportunity to trade, to be young again, to be 16, and to erase my experience and my memories, I would keep what I have. I wouldn't want to be 16 again. Because it has been so beautiful, whether it was negative or positive, good or bad, I just loved every moment of my journey that I did in the music. And I am truly thankful and truly blessed, even with the DJs that you know we have right here in Jamaica, one of the most amazing things I find with our DJs, they are so creative. Creativity is unlimited. And as our speaker said earlier, we have to just recognize what we have, develop on it, and just stay focused on what we know we are blessed with. Because you can see the people, the few that are called, because we say many are called, but few are chosen. And we know the few people that God has blessed with um, the gift of communicating through music, which is the one vehicle that we know can go to the four corners of the earth, which is where Bob and many others took it. Jimmy Cliff, um, Freddie McGregor, Dennis Brown, so many of us that are in this business of, you know, where we can create. The DJs are so creative, and it amazes me when I hear a DJ doing a song. And I, I often wonder how, how this guy come up with all these lyrics, you know? Well, I'm not talking about the negative ones, you know? I'm talking about positive lyrics that the young people can learn from, because as he said earlier, from the babies born, they can sing the song. That I often say that they should take the music, the, the lesson in the schools through music and teach the children because uh, they all know every song as his song is released, three years old, they can sing the song. So I am thankful that I can stand here this morning and communicate to you. And of course, I'm not going to leave you until I say thanks to you for your support over the years. And of course, thanks to Almighty God for preserving me. And what would I be without your support and your help? And also, I just want to say to my sisters, especially in the business, make sure you're not being used because we are special. We are mothers of creation. And don't forget that when especially promoters give us a platform and an audience, make sure we are not going up there to exalt ourselves. We are creative people, we are talented people, and don't forget at the end of the day, when everyone is gone their separate way, 
we are left with ourselves to look into ourselves and sometimes we feel very ashamed and remember that the same mouth the same mouth that says hooray says go away <laughs> for real so I don't know how much you want me to elaborate on you know being in this business done that journey for 50 years because I know there are others who want to come up and speak but I am truly thankful and thanks to you it's shining time again for me thank you so very much Ladies and gentlemen, the extremely talented and so modest Marcia Griffiths. Because if you've ever done the electric slide, I'm sure Mr. Hawkins has, or you've at least seen it in some of his films, um, the lady, Marcia Griffiths, another round of applause for her. I want to take some time as well to acknowledge the presence of former Governor General Sir Kenneth Hall, who's with us. Good morning, Sir Kenneth. So we're going to hear from a youngster in the business. Jesse Royal is a songwriter and performing artist, and he's going to share a little bit with us as well about being a creator in this industry. Welcome, Jesse. Pleasant morning to all the distinguished guests. Well, I'll keep it short because Sister Marcia kind of summed it up. And being a young artist, I'm really here to learn about what else to do. You know, but um, from my perspective, you know, this, um, in this technological age where it is easier for the creator to get from his headspace to the animated artwork, I think it's super crucial for us to understand the rights that come with the creation because it's not just about a song. In writing a song, there's the lyrics different from the arrangement of the song, different from the production of the material. So it's very key for us to understand the amount of intellectual property that goes with our works and um, in respecting that, um, go with the necessary ways uh, of protecting the product, which, which is our pension as musicians. Yeah, because we spend most of our time on creativity. I mean. Food, I mean, food is secondary. You know, creativity is priority for us. We spend days and nights creating. So, as I said, long story short, with this day and age, is just about um, protecting, protecting, protecting the material. So, your your mind has a lot more time to be creative. In terms of our government, for me, it is about develop developing the environment to harbor creativity because I mean in, an, in a nation where our resources are limited we have to utilize the creativity and the ingenuity of our people because I mean there's a lot of negativity and this and that but it is the ingenuity of the people that create the loopholes that go around all the negativity so we need to start um, acknowledging that and, and respecting the fact that it is the people that build the society. So creators, create and, and protect. Blessed love. Some wise words from the young, huh? How do we channel that creativity into something positive? Well, ladies and gentlemen, with that, we've come to the end of the official opening ceremony of our regional conference on IP and creative industries. Remember? We have uh, two sessions today at 1 o'clock. It's the creative industries as a factor for economic growth, and that will happen right here in this room. And then at 3.15, the Exim Bank monetizing intellectual property. We're going to break now for lunch, and then we'll resume at exactly 1 p.m. But I want to thank all of our speakers this morning for sharing with us, and to you as well for being with us this morning. So... With that, I'll see you at one. God bless.